Okay, so what I'm going over tonight, this is the first part of a four-part series on overcoming addiction for meditation. And uh, the first part tonight is called Addiction, a Symptom, Not a Disease. And I'm going to go over kind of a more sociological aspect or overview of why addiction is a symptom and not really a disease from my point of view. All right, so first, why am I doing this? Um, when I was originally caught from using heroin and cocaine, I uh, went to jail for six months, and the only way I could deal with the, uh, the anxiety of being in jail was through meditation. I found some books in jail and began to read a lot about meditation. Since I've been out of jail, not since uh, last October, I've continued to meditate daily and have really come to a really good understanding of how uh, meditation can help you overcome addiction. All right, so I'm going to go over a few meditations, just overview a couple meditations that can be used um, for addiction, and then I'm going to go into them into a little bit more depth at the end of the talk. Um, the first is a focus meditation, and how this works is you just find a quiet spot and you take the first letter of your first name and picture it in your mind. Do a white letter on the black background of, of your mind and focus on it for as long as you can. And I'll go over some more specifics on that one afterwards. Okay, uh, the second one is uh, the countdown technique. And it's not really a meditation, but more of a technique for motivation. And it basically goes like this. If you're lazy or you're sitting on a chair or you're having a hard time getting motivated to do something, you simply do a countdown because the countdown is so ingrained into our subconscious. We have countdowns for everything, for like uh, rocket launches, um, starting of events, you know, so many things in our society use a countdown to begin an event. So it's a really powerful technique. <clears throat> so you think, you want to get out of bed, okay? Your alarm goes off, you don't want to get out of bed, but you know you have to. So you just count down from 10, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. When you hit one, you just get out of bed. It sounds really simple, but it really is powerful. Um, all right, so we're going to start off with an explanation of uh, meditation. <clears throat> and this is called the screen actor's metaphor. And it's a metaphor that I came up with, but I think it really demonstrates the, how meditation works with your mind. So you have your conscious mind and your subconscious mind. Okay, so what you want to do is pretend to see your conscious mind as a giant screen. And as you're looking at the screen, you see all the events of your life, things that are happening, all your thoughts that are running through your head. You look up on the screen and you see what you see in your conscious mind, okay? Maybe you have problems with a loved one or, you know, some crisis at your work. And what meditation does is it's a little magic door that allows you to open up, uh, you stick it on the screen, you open up the door, and you're able to go back into your subconscious. And as you travel back into your subconscious mind, you begin to see all the facets and aspects of why you have all this stuff on your conscious screen. So you begin to see the actors, and the director, and the producer, and the catering crew, and the stagehands. And then you start to notice that, well, the director and the producer are starting to have a little fight about whatnot, you know. The director's not doing something the way the producers want him to do it. And you start to notice that one of the main actors is having an affair with uh, one of the stagehands. And you start to notice that maybe the catering crew isn't serving the best food, and so everybody's unhappy about the food. And some of the second stage actresses are off in the room doing drugs or something. You start to notice all these problems back in the set. And you begin to realize that, ah, this is why the picture that I see in my conscious mind isn't that great of a movie. Okay. So, uh, next thing I'd like to cover is, I'm going to use that metaphor throughout this talk. So, okay, next thing is, uh, in AA meetings, okay, in meditation, we have something that's called auto-suggestions. And what an auto-suggestion is, 
is basically something you tell yourself about yourself that you begin to believe over time. Um, now imagine a five-year-old kid and their parents constantly telling them that he's garbage and that he's trash and that he's worthless. After a while, he begins to believe it. Well, what an auto-suggestion is, is a way to counteract that. You get into a meditative state and you begin to tell yourself uh, good things, things that you like about yourself, okay? Well, they don't just work with meditation, but it works in daily life. Um, so one thing I want to bring in about, you know, AA meetings and drug abuse meetings and things like that is the auto-suggestion that you start the meeting off with. And it usually goes like, hi, my name's Thomas Wright and I'm an alcoholic. So the thing that I really don't like about that is the first thing is, you're telling everybody your name. So you put that label up there, Thomas Wright. And that's the name that you go by. That is your label. When people think Thomas Wright, they think everything about me. They see me as a person. Everything they know about me comes to their mind. <laughs> and the problem with that is, right after you say your label, you say, and I'm an alcoholic. So immediately following your label, you throw that second label under there saying, I'm an alcoholic, which reinforces the idea of you being an alcoholic, not only in your mind, but in everybody else's mind. So, let's say we started doing something like this in AA meetings, okay? Hi, I'm Thomas Wright. I love good music. I enjoy playing the guitar. I am absolutely fascinated with computers and how they work. I have been feeling good more and more lately. And I'm here because I am currently working hard on dissolving my past addiction to heroin and cocaine. What that does is, you bring in a bunch of positive things that you find that you like about yourself. So you start off with a bunch of positive notes, okay? And then you finish with, let me go over this one more time, and I am here because I am currently working hard on dissolving my past addiction to heroin and cocaine. Okay? As soon as you represent your addiction as possibly being dissolved, and that you are currently working on dissolving that. The power in that is so immense that you begin to actually believe that and therefore it actually starts happening. Um, the reason why they originally had you do that in AA meetings and other drug addiction meetings was because they wanted you to acknowledge that you had a problem. Well, you can acknowledge that you have a problem without making it your problem, without making it the biggest part of your life. You can acknowledge that you had an addiction and that you are working on dissolving the addiction without actually saying, and I am a drug addict, or and I am an alcoholic, and reinforcing that in your mind. Okay, so the payoffs of meditation. What are the payoffs of meditation? Um, I'm gonna go through a few here. <coughs> um, focus is a payoff of meditation. Extreme focus. Um, I'm gonna go over something a talk that I heard by a man named Stuart Hameroff. He worked with, he's an MD at uh, University of Arizona, and he worked on a theory with Roger Penrose called the Orchestrated Objective Reduction Theory. It's a really fascinating talk, you can find it on YouTube, but basically what he says is that the brain is way more complex than we originally think. Um, within each neuron, you have a, a series of what are called microtubules that actually uh, do a quantum calculation. And so if we normally see the brain as just purely, uh, so I'm sorry, purely neuronic power, just all these neurons that's doing all these calculations, um, the power that is thought to be in the amount of uh, calculative, calculative power within each neuron is about the same as the entire brain represents. So what we originally thought the brain was capable of of uh, producing calculation-wise can actually be calculated on one single neuron, which gives the calculative power of the entire brain quite a lot more meaning. Well, he discovered that um, there's something that happens in the brain 